The Labor Day weekend turned into a nightmare of murder as a cross-country crime spree terrorized the nation. A pair of suspected spree killers traveled through state after state, leaving murder victims in their wake. Working against time, the FBI and local authorities marshaled their resources to stop the killings. In a small Ohio community, an elderly woman and a teenage boy disappeared. Because they vanished within hours of each other, police believe the cases were linked, but they didn't know how. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. A trail of stolen vehicles and murder victims across seven states led the FBI in a hunt for two serial killers. Their only hope of stopping them was to anticipate the killers Next move. August 29th, 1994. Summer was drawing to a close in the small town of Port Washington, Ohio. The peaceful farming community was dotted with isolated rural homes. A 79-year-old widow, Ruth Loder, lived alone. Those of her family that lived nearby kept a close eye on Mrs. Loder since she was battling with cancer. When she heard footsteps in the kitchen, she thought it might be her granddaughter returning to see her before she went to sleep. She discovered strangers instead. Tuscarawas County Sheriff's Office received an urgent call from Mrs. Loder's sister. As was their routine, Mrs. Loder's sister and son-in-law came to check on the sick woman, but found Mrs. Loder and her car missing. Sheriff Walter Wilson, a detective lieutenant at the time, was the lead investigator. Family members had seen Mrs. Loder the evening prior to the morning of her disappearance. Uh, she was fine at that time. Uh, they had indicated to us that Mrs. Loder was recovering from cancer surgery, that she definitely needed medication, which was left behind. The family was worried since Mrs. Loder was so weak. She would become very ill if she was without her medication for long. Marks on the back door and damage to the door frame indicated it had been kicked in. The forced entry told the sheriff that the frail woman had not left of her own free will. Mrs. Loder's purse was left behind, but her cash was missing, along with the keys to her red Buick. Sheriff Wilson immediately issued an all-points bulletin for the widow and her car. Sheriff's Department. He knew that they'd have the best chance of finding her alive if they acted quickly. We felt very early on that uh, Mrs. Loder obviously had been kidnapped. We immediately began a massive search for Mrs. Loder and her car. Uh, and that involved all of the area law enforcement agencies. It involved numerous fire department uh, personnel. Citizens from the area came out uh, in droves and helped with the search for Mrs. Loder. And I need you two to work rush. We're going to try to stay in this general area. Concerned over her fate, the community was united in its pursuit. The command center was formed in the Port Washington Fire Station, where authorities worked with volunteers to plan the urgent search for the ailing woman. If she didn't have her medicine soon, her condition could become critical. They had to find the grandmother before it was too late. Mrs. Loder was pretty well known in that area. Uh, it's a very good family. 
Uh, they're very highly thought of, and uh, everyone was very concerned for her and uh, felt uh, obligated and, and really sincerely wanted to try to find her to help her. Mounted reserve units geared up to comb rougher terrain on horseback. Local police and neighbors searched fields and woods for any trace of her or the missing car. Sheriff's deputies from a neighboring county brought in canine units hoping to pick up a scent. The Ohio State Highway Patrol ordered their aircraft to scan roads from above. The extensive search turned up no trace of Mrs. Loader or her car. Special collections were taken at restaurants and grocery stores to help pay for additional personnel. Deputies alerted the media while family members posted flyers in neighboring towns, hoping to get the word out beyond the local community. That afternoon, a woman who knew Mrs. Loader called the sheriff's office with information and came in for an interview. She told investigators that she'd seen Mrs. Loader's red Buick in town at about 11 p.m. the previous evening. She thought it was strange that the ailing woman would be driving that late. Though the light was dim, she could see that a young man was driving the car. The witness tried her best to help a police artist construct a composite sketch from what she could remember of the brief encounter. In the area surrounding Port Washington, Ohio, concern that a criminal could be on the loose spread fear in a community that was not used to locking their doors. Police showed the composite sketch at every interview, but no one could identify the man depicted in the drawing. The day ended with no new leads. On day two of Mrs. Loader's disappearance, a deputy entered her case into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, a computer system linking 57,000 law enforcement agencies across the country. That same day, the sheriff's office fielded a call from some concerned parents. Their 16-year-old high school sophomore had also disappeared from Tuscarawas County. In nearby Newcomerstown, three miles from the house where Mrs. Loader disappeared, a worried father and stepmother told a sheriff's deputy their son was missing. His family and his former employer had not heard from him for three days. Yes, I do. One other thing too, officer. A 22 caliber handgun was also missing from the house. The parents gave authorities a photograph of the missing boy, Eric Elliott. It seemed kind of ironic at the time that we would have Mrs. Loader missing and that we would also have a, a juvenile reported missing uh, within that short distance. Ohio investigators wondered if there was any connection between the two disappearances from the same county. Just 36 hours after Mrs. Loader's abduction, Sheriff Wilson received another call. Hello? 650 miles west in Fulton, Missouri, police found a red Buick stuck in a farmer's muddy field. When they ran its Ohio plates through the NCIC, they discovered it was Mrs. Loader's stolen car. The farmer had not seen who had abandoned it. The car's keys were missing, but the doors were unlocked. Among the items officers found inside was a green soda bottle and a sandwich wrapper labeled Goshen Dairy Store. They towed the vehicle to the station for further examination. Lieutenant Timothy Daimler from the Callaway County Sheriff's Office in Fulton, Missouri, was assigned to lead the investigation. His department's first task was to check the car's locked trunk. We weren't sure exactly what we were going to find, 
uh, we had a missing lady from Ohio, and this was her car, so we were under the assumption that very possibly we may find a body when we opened up the trunk. Investigators needed to open it without damaging evidence or injuring the woman if she was unconscious inside. An auxiliary deputy who was a locksmith was called in. They discovered the trunk was empty. After three days of searching, hope of finding Mrs. Loder alive was beginning to fade. On September 1st, an FBI evidence recovery team from Kansas City was called in since the missing woman's car had crossed state lines. Agents worked with local authorities processing Mrs. Loder's car for forensic details. They gathered several sets of prints and hairs. In Ohio, the foreign prints were entered into an automated fingerprint system, but no matches were found. Sheriff Wilson prepared to travel to Missouri. On a hunch, he took along a photo of the missing teenager, Eric Elliott. At the time, it was nothing concrete as, as far as connecting uh, Mrs. Loder's disappearance and Mr. Elliott's uh, report of his son missing. However, I felt that since we're going to Callaway County, you know, it, it would make sense to maybe obtain a, a photograph of the missing juvenile and take with us. Mrs. Loder's son-in-law joined the sheriff to help in the investigation. See what we can do. The Missouri official did not recognize the photo, but the Ohio sheriff did recognize the sandwich wrapper found in the car. It was from Goshen Dairy, a store near Mrs. Loder's house. Her son-in-law said the family kept her vehicle clean. Perhaps Eric Elliott, who also lived close to the store, had left the wrapper in the car. They had a photograph of Elliott with them, and we decided to cover Kingdom City, which uh, where would they would have gotten off the interstate. Ohio and Missouri investigators checked exits along nearby I-70, a major east-west route in the region. They hoped someone at the rest stops would be able to confirm that Elliot had been in the area. They spoke to dozens of employees and travelers. Late in the afternoon, their efforts finally paid off. You haven't seen him since then? No, I haven't. They found one person who remembered seeing the teenager the day before. Unfortunately, authorities found no one who remembered seeing Mrs. Loder or her car. For the first time, investigators considered 16-year-old Eric Elliott as a suspect in her abduction. Missouri deputies also continued to canvass the rural Fulton area, inquiring if neighbors had seen anything unusual. At the house closest to the field where Mrs. Loder's car was found, an officer knocked on the door of an elderly couple, William and Flossie Brewer, he heard their dog, but the couple appeared to be out. Since their car was not parked outside, the deputy continued on. Authorities checked dozens of homes, but found no one close by who had seen Eric Elliott or Mrs. Loder. I was on my way home. After finishing that up, I received a page from the uh, communication center uh, that they wanted me to call them immediately. They told me that they had found two bodies uh, at a farmhouse out on County Road 147. It was the home of William and Flossie Brewer, the house closest to the field where Mrs. Loder's car was found earlier that day. Authorities believe the two crimes were likely connected. Three days after Mrs. Loder's disappearance, sheriff's detectives found the bodies of 86-year-old William Brewer and his 76-year-old wife Flossie in the basement of their home. Each had multiple gunshot wounds. They were slumped over. They were near the door. She had her hands tied behind her back which, with what appeared to be a telephone cord. And he was on her right, slumped over also. And he had, his cane was standing there right beside him. 
The detective also found the couple's dog faithfully guarding their lifeless bodies. An autopsy later determined that both Mr. and Mrs. Brewer had each been shot three times in the head with a 22. the same caliber weapon missing from Eric Elliott's home. The 16-year-old suspected in the disappearance of Mrs. Loader now became a suspect in the double homicide. There was no indication that the suspect had spent any length of time in the house before this occurred. So from the evidence, it pointed us that it had happened relatively quickly. Investigators found no signs of forced entry. In the basement, the door to the outside was covered with cobwebs, indicating it had not been opened. Yesterday. Yesterday. Okay. Now, Investigators spoke with the brewer's the son. He said the couple's Oldsmobile was missing, along with several rifles. All were entered into the NCIC. The son added that his mother's bedspread was also missing. Technicians worked the scene until 5 a.m. On the floor near the front entrance, investigators found two distinct sets of footprints far into the house. One appeared to be a tennis shoe, the other a hiking boot. Well, Investigators suspected the double homicide was likely connected to Mrs. Loader's disappearance. No, just... What they didn't know was if 16-year-old Eric Elliott and a companion had become spree killers. By September 2nd, 1994, four and a half days had passed since the ailing Ruth Loader was forced from her Ohio home without her medication. She was missing and presumed dead since her stolen car was found abandoned in Missouri, 150 yards from where police discovered a slain elderly couple. Authorities suspected an Ohio teenager named Eric Elliott and at least one companion were responsible for the crimes. But they had no direct evidence. Lieutenant Timothy Daimler of the Callaway County, Missouri Sheriff's Department recalled that citizens in the surrounding areas were stunned. These are people that, that live in the rural community. They're used to leaving their doors unlocked. Um, they do know everybody. And uh, I think it was somewhat of a uh, realization that unfortunately, uh, even though you do live in a rural community, that you still have to lock your doors and pay attention to when strangers are in your neighborhood. With two confirmed homicides and a likely third in as many days, local authorities turned to the FBI for help. Special Agent Peter Christ of the FBI's Canton, yes. Ohio resident yes. agency was assigned the case. Okay. To catch up with the suspected spree killer and his companion, they needed an idea of where Eric Elliott might be heading. So we were trying to get as much background information as we could. We were looking for relatives, uncles, aunts, cousins, friends. We were convinced that they were heading across the country, and we just needed to know everybody that there was a possibility that they would stop and visit to either visit to say hello or, or get any kind of financial or moral yeah, support. Can I call you, TJ? Yeah. You seem like a nice up here. Agents asked one of Eric Elliott's friends to come in for questioning. The friend told them that Elliott had recently become very close to a young ex-convict named Louis Gilbert. He said that Gilbert and Elliott had spent a lot of time together over the past few weeks. Both had been complaining about how boring life was in the small town and that there was no reason for them to stay. Gilbert was estranged from his wife and son, and Elliot wished to visit his birth mother in California. I just got out of jail. The friend added that the pair mentioned they wanted to do something that would make them go down in history and planned to start by stealing a car. They mentioned that. We were drinking and got the talk. The last time he saw them was five days ago, when Gilbert and Elliot were walking along railroad tracks behind Mrs. Loader's house. Because Elliot was a troubled teen, Agent Chris believed that he probably looked up to 22-year-old Lewis Gilbert, since Gilbert appeared to do as he pleased. At the point when Gilbert befriended Elliot, he had been released from jail two weeks prior to that, uh, had a criminal history, had had a history of getting, getting in trouble. And at that point, we sort of felt that maybe Mr. Elliot was was um, in awe or enamored with Mr. Gilbert because he did have that kind of criminal history background. That's exactly what we expected. 
investigators dug deeper into Lewis Gilbert's past. The 22-year-old had served time for stealing a boat and breaking an entering. He had also been convicted of physically abusing his three-month-old son. Though agents still lacked concrete evidence that Gilbert and Elliot were traveling together, they needed to find them as soon as possible to prevent any more killing. Our biggest concern at this point was is that we suspected these two of Mrs. Loder's disappearance. They were strong suspects in the, in the killings and in, in the double homicide in Missouri. And we were, con we were very concerned that this kind of activity would continue all the way across the country. Sheriff Wilson's first step was to see if anyone had seen Gilbert with Elliot at the Goshen Dairy Store, close to Mrs. Loder's Ohio home. Missouri investigators had found a sandwich wrapper from the store in Mrs. Loder's abandoned vehicle. Does this look familiar to you? Yeah. One of our wrappers is our sandwich. The clerk identified the wrapper. She also remembered selling the sandwich and some soda to Gilbert and Elliot just after Mrs. Loder disappeared. Authorities now had confirmation the young men were traveling together. Thank you. But five days had already passed since the spree killers had begun their cross-country rampage. The FBI quickly secured arrest warrants for kidnapping and burglary in the Ruth Loader disappearance. Though agents believe the pair was also responsible for the double homicide in Missouri, yeah, authorities still lacked evidence to formally charge them with yeah, those yeah, crimes. Agents weren't about to wait for someone to call in. Anticipating Gilbert and Elliot's westward movement, the FBI visited Gilbert's mother in Taliqua, Oklahoma on September 3, 1994. The agent warned her that her son and his friend were armed fugitives, suspected of driving a stolen Oldsmobile with Missouri plates. It was possible that the pair would visit her for help. I need to know if you've seen them recently. Oh, they just left this morning. This morning? Yes. The FBI had just missed them. Gilbert and Elliot had arrived at 2 a.m. the previous day. Gilbert claimed the Oldsmobile they were driving belonged to a friend. They said they were headed to California. The pair spent the day and left a few hours before the agent arrived. Cooperating with the FBI, she described the clothes the pair was wearing and gave agents addresses of other relatives. Authorities feared that if they didn't catch up with them soon, the spree killers would strike again. That was one of the most frustrating things about this whole investigation. It just appeared that we were always a half a day or a day behind them. And that's probably one of the most frustrating things. We just couldn't get ahead of them. Because Eric Elliott was a minor, investigators needed court permission to distribute his photo. They got the go-ahead 36 hours after the double homicide in Missouri. Lieutenant Daimler added it to the nationwide bulletins for the fugitives. I was scared to see where they were going to end up next and who they were going to kill next. And I wanted to do everything I could to help get those people off the street because it was apparent to me that they didn't care who they killed. Despite the best efforts of authorities, the urgent hunt for the suspected killers stretched into its sixth day. On September 4, 1994, 165 miles west of Gilbert's mother's house in Oklahoma, a dirt biker was riding the rural trails around Draper Lake, just outside of Oklahoma City. His ride was cut short when he discovered a woman's body amongst the trees. As he raced to summon police, he rode around an Oldsmobile with Missouri plates. Almost a week after Mrs. Loder's abduction in Ohio, the nationwide hunt for two suspected killers would continue. By September 4, 1994, six days had elapsed in the FBI's massive nationwide search for a pair of suspected spree killers. Lewis Gilbert and Eric Elliott were wanted for a possible murder in Ohio and a confirmed double homicide in Missouri. The fugitives were last seen in Oklahoma, heading west. 
That same day, Oklahoma City Police responded to a call from a dirt biker who had discovered a woman's body near Draper Lake. Officers secured the crime scene, then called in homicide detectives. They interviewed the biker who had made the discovery. Homicide inspector Bob Bemo of the Oklahoma City Police Department was assigned the case. Once we come upon the immediate scene where the body was located, I uh, observed the uh, young woman to be in a kind of a bent over backwards and caught between a tree. The victim was a white female in her 30s. Investigators found no identification on or near the body. But a manager at a nearby marina later identified her as his missing employee, Roxy Rudder. As a part of our investigation, an, another vehicle had been found uh, a short distance away from where the victim had been located. And uh, we didn't know if this was a part of the crime or not, although we did secure the area around this vehicle. When detectives checked the Oldsmobile's Missouri plates with the NCIC, they discovered the car had been reported stolen from the Brewers, the double homicide victims from Missouri. Oklahoma investigators immediately notified authorities back east. To Tuscarawas County Sheriff Walter Wilson in Ohio, it appeared that Gilbert and Elliot had struck again. They had recovered Missouri's stolen vehicle and they also had a, another murder victim. It's just another terrible feeling that's really hard to describe that obviously this tragedy uh, continues. Oklahoma police crime technicians gathered evidence from the vehicle. They recovered several unused 22 caliber bullets. A pawn shop receipt from a local Oklahoma City store was also found. Prints lifted from inside and outside the car matched both Gilbert and Elliot's. Oklahoma medical examiners determined that Ruddle's death had occurred in the last day or two since there was little decomposition. Death had been inflicted by a 22 caliber weapon. Detectives notified the woman's devastated husband. He informed them that her two-toned pickup truck was also missing. Investigators listed it as stolen and added its information to the growing NCIC report on Gilbert and Elliot. Detectives also took the receipt found in the brewer's car to the Oklahoma City pawn shop that issued it. Two video games and a socket wrench set had been pawned the day before the murdered woman was found. They showed the receipt to an employee. He vaguely remembered Gilbert and Elliot, but he had something else that might be stronger than memory. The pawn shop was equipped with a 24-hour surveillance camera. The videotape confirmed his story. September 3rd was the last confirmed sighting of Gilbert and Elliot. The FBI issued two more warrants for the suspected killers for unlawful interstate flight. Agent Peter Christ and his team were frustrated that after six days, four victims, and thousands of man hours, the killers remained a half day ahead of the FBI. A lot of things were going through my mind. Number one, um, we didn't want another double homicide, and we didn't want another killing any place. And we were, I guess, what I kept thinking about: what have I not done? What have, what haven't I? What lead have I not sent out? What, let, me look, let me look everything over again to see maybe if we can somehow get ahead of these guys instead of being behind them for a half a day or a day. The nationwide hunt for Gilbert and Elliot intensified. Law enforcement agencies mobilized additional helicopters to search for Roxy Ruddle's two-toned pickup truck on routes heading west. Long-haul truck drivers were also notified to report any sightings on the road or at rest stops. Hundreds of calls poured into police in Oklahoma, Missouri, and Ohio. But none led to the fugitives' immediate whereabouts. Every time the phone rang, uh, I was very concerned that it would be another body. 
and it's a terrible feeling when you work in a case like this, when you know what has happened up to that point and what you envision, the worst thing you can envision in your mind would happen is if this thing continued. So every time the phone rang and somebody said it was for me, that, that was my biggest fear. I, that was the first thing that came into my mind. Oh, we found another body. The two suspected spree killers had chosen elderly people and women as their prey. And the FBI didn't know where or whom they would strike next. By September 5th, 1994, after a week of searching, the FBI and local law enforcement were no closer to finding two suspects in a killing spree that spanned three states. Agents believe that 22-year-old Lewis Gilbert and 16-year-old Eric Elliott were headed to the home of Elliott's mother in California, driving a stolen two-tone pickup truck with Oklahoma plates. Missouri Lieutenant Timothy Daimler feared the murder suspects would kill again if they decided to steal another car as they traveled west. I wasn't thinking serial killer at the time. Um, I guess what was going through my mind at the time that was that these guys didn't care who they killed and I was thinking that we need to catch these people. News reports and bulletins alerted people in western states that the suspected killers were headed their way, armed and dangerous. In New Mexico, state police criminal agent Daniel Becker first heard about the fugitives through the media. My initial thought was that um, the chances of them being apprehended in New Mexico were extremely slim because of the wide open spaces that we have and, and a relatively small amount of law enforcement that we have throughout the state. The same day the reports began to hit the news in New Mexico, Gilbert and Elliot stopped at the rural home of an older couple 15 miles south of Santa Fe. They claimed that the stolen two-tone pickup truck was low on gas. The couple agreed to help. The fugitives said they were on their way to California, but the woman was suspicious since she didn't see any luggage in the truck. To her, they seemed jumpy and left in a hurry when they heard the noise of nearby construction workers. State police and great, this is Carmen. The woman reported the sighting to the New Mexico State Police. But by the time units arrived to investigate, the two young men were nowhere in sight. The following morning of September 6th, a New Mexico man reported another sighting to police. How you doing? He claimed to have seen Gilbert and Elliot the previous night. The man told the officer that he first encountered them while driving on Highway 599 outside Santa Fe. The motorist saw two young hitchhikers and pulled over to pick them up. They said their pickup truck had gotten stuck in the mud. He didn't realize who they were until he saw their photos on the news the next morning, describing them as suspected killers. The witness said he gave the pair a ride to the store where they bought food and gas. Later that night, he saw them again and drove them back to the place they had first met. It was a desolate part of the highway. The officer needed a landmark to estimate where the motorist had dropped the fugitives. The man said it was close to a small overpass. In the chance that the fugitives were still in the area, he alerted all area law enforcement. The New Mexico State Police were aware they had to move fast.
two units raced to the location to conduct a search for any trace of the suspected murderers. They found the overpass in a remote area. Reports had warned that the Ohio men were armed. Gilbert and Elliot would be tired and desperate after running and hiding for seven days with little money. Officers prepared for the worst. Probably leave content cover, okay? Once we got him, we'll give you the signal. If the fugitives were still in the area, they had miles of shrubs and hills behind which they could conceal themselves and take aim at anyone approaching. Just wait there. Exactly. Officers were instructed to use extreme caution. Going on the north side, we're going on the south side. Okay, good luck. You'll get my signal. The team Let's wanted to bring them back down. alive. They scanned the dust for footprints, food wrappers, and soda bottles. Anything that might indicate the suspected killers were still in the area. They approached one of six culverts underneath the highway. Carefully, they moved forward for a closer look. One officer spotted two men lying on the ground inside, apparently sleeping. One of the startled men appeared to be groping for his gun in the dark. In the next split second, officers had to decide whether they needed to use deadly force to stop the suspected spree killers. On September 6, 1994, New Mexico State Police were within a few feet of murder suspects Lewis Gilbert and Eric Elliott. The fugitives reached for their weapons, but chose not to die. After a murder spree that took the lives of four victims in less than a week, the pair was arrested without a struggle. The 1,800-mile chase had ended. FBI Special Agent Peter Christ got the news of their arrest in Ohio. My reaction, of course, when I received that news was a tremendous sigh of relief. Uh, the first thing I wanted to know, it was after they'd been caught, whether any bodies, were there any unsolved homicides close to where they were, they were arrested? Of course, the answer was no. Uh, just a tremendous sigh of relief that this whole thing was finally, finally over. Officers recovered a 22 handgun and a green soda bottle at the campsite where the pair were apprehended. They also found the bedspread belonging to the murdered Mrs. Brewer. State police found Roxy Ruddle's stolen pickup two miles away near a racetrack in Santa Fe. Like their other two stolen vehicles, the truck was stuck in the mud. Examining fingerprints, crime scene and lab investigators matched personal items to the murdered woman in Oklahoma City. Investigators also found another green soda bottle, the same brand they had found under the culvert and in Ruth Loder's car. Eric Elliott and Lewis Gilbert were taken to the New Mexico State Police District Office in Santa Fe. If they could turn one against the other, their prosecution would be assured. 16-year-old Eric Elliott made one phone call to his father in Ohio and refused to say anything about the killings. Now it was Lewis Gilbert's turn. The ex-convict waived his rights and agreed to be interviewed. New Mexico State Police criminal agent Daniel Becker had little time to prepare. Gilbert revealed very little during the first hour of our interview about these killings. Um, a couple times he made mention of, uh, I asked him if he had did this out of, uh, for some justifiable reason or if he's a cold-blooded killer. 
And he responded by saying, one of those. Gilbert claimed that he didn't recall what had happened over the past five days. Did you murder him? He refused to say anything about the murders or Mrs. Loder's disappearance. Frustrated, the investigator left the room. A few moments alone was all Gilbert needed. After we had taken our first break, Gilbert began to open up a little bit more, and he actually made an admission that he had killed between one and five people. And when I had asked him why he'd killed people, he said, for stupid reasons. Gilbert began by recounting the day he met the woman in Oklahoma. He said that he and Elliot struck up a conversation with Roxy Ruddle when they found her fishing alone in a secluded area of Draper Lake near Oklahoma City. They told her that their car was stuck in the mud and needed a ride back to town. She offered to help and packed up her gear. Her pickup truck was parked just up the hill. Give me the keys. When her back was turned, Gilbert pulled the 22 pistol Elliot had taken from his parents' Ohio home. Then Gilbert told Elliot to tie Ruddle's hands. Gilbert said Ruddle cried and asked them not to hurt her. Elliot stayed behind while Gilbert marched Ruddle into the woods. He told her to sit down at the base of a tree. Then he shot Roxy Ruddle. Now that Gilbert had admitted to one murder, the agent pressed him on the others. He asked the confessed killer to describe what had happened in Missouri the day before he got to Oklahoma. Gilbert advised me that they had been traveling through the state of Missouri, and the evening before the murders, they had parked the stolen vehicle that they had obtained in Ohio in what I was led to believe was a field. And the follow they'd slept in the vehicle overnight, and the following morning or afternoon when they were about to leave, they realized the vehicle was stuck. So they needed to get another vehicle. As Missouri investigators believed, Gilbert and Elliot had simply walked to the closest house and saw a car in the driveway. It was the home of Mr. and Mrs. Brewer. Gilbert decided they'd asked to use the phone to call for a tow. Hello, sir. How you doing? Oh, pretty good. Oh, you got our, our car. Thank right. you so much. Wanting to help, the brewers let the young men in. Once inside, they learned that they didn't have a telephone book, so they couldn't come up with a number to call for a wrecker. And it's at that point that Gilbert told me that he decided, or they decided, that they were going to kill the Brewers. Come on, move, 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 move. They led the grandfather and grandmother into the basement. To me. Keep going. Then executed them. There was one more crime that Gilbert had not discussed. The elderly cancer patient from Ohio, Mrs. Loader, was still missing and presumed dead. No one knew what had become of her. On the evening of August 29, 1994, Lewis Gilbert and Eric Elliott approached Mrs. Loader's Port Washington home to steal her car.
Since no one answered when they knocked, they believed the house was empty. Stick it in. So they broke in to search for the car keys. After 10 minutes, they still hadn't found the keys. As they rummaged through the living room, they were startled when Mrs. Loader suddenly appeared. He claimed Mrs. Loader was still alive when he locked her in the trunk of her car and sped off. They got about four miles outside of town in a wooded area, and they pulled up alongside of a guardrail and parked, got outside. Uh, Gilbert told me that he opened the trunk and he picked up Mrs. Loader out of the trunk, and they took her off the road near the guardrail, about five feet from the side of the road. Gilbert said he forced Mrs. Loader to walk away from the car. He said he shot her with the same 22 that had killed the others. We drove a little ways and... Uh... Gilbert had finished his description of the murders. But he hadn't told the agent where they could find the murdered Ohio woman. We knew it was crucial to find Mrs. Loader's body, uh, both as evidence so this murder could be prosecuted and also just uh, simply as closure for the family so that um, they could find her and, and make for proper arrangements for a funeral. Gilbert gave authorities directions to find Mrs. Loder's remains. Fifty people from the FBI and 12 different law enforcement and volunteer groups followed Gilbert's directions. They searched for the dead woman in fields and woods and hills for days. But the 79-year-old widow and mother of four was never found. Sheriff Walter Wilson continues to work the open case. When you work a murder case, you almost become part of a family, so to speak, because your, your goal, obviously, is to solve the crime, to help the victims, the surviving victims, as much as you possibly can. Uh, it's something, obviously, that will never, ever be forgotten. Uh, I have a high respect for the Loader family, having got to know them very well. I feel bad to this day that we've not yet been able to recover Mrs. Loader's remains. 16-year-old Eric Elliott stood trial as an adult in Oklahoma. Elliott was found guilty of first-degree murder for his participation in the killing of Roxy Ruddle. He was sentenced to life without parole. In Missouri, after 57 years of marriage, the Brewers were laid to rest. Unlike the family of Ruth Loder, the Brewer family was able to have some closure for their tragic loss. After being sentenced to death for the murder of Roxy Ruddle in Oklahoma, Lewis Gilbert was extradited to Missouri, where he stood trial for the murders of William and Flossie Brewer. Lewis, where's Ruth? Where's the lady in Ohio? Where's Ruth, Lewis? Give her family a break. He remained silent on the whereabouts of Ruth Loder's remains. Since the Ohio woman has not yet been recovered, there has been no trial date set to answer for her kidnapping and murder. For her family and friends, Gilbert and Elliot's actions are unconscionable. I've often thought what, what goes through their mind or what causes them to do that, and I, I really, it's hard to understand or, or think what they're thinking other than obviously they have to be uh, very evil people. <laughs> 